Welcome to the US Roundtable of the Global UAE Energy Forum, where we're going to use this digital stage to ask a critical question. How can Biden reposition the US as a climate leader in his first 100 days in office, of course, if at all? We'll see, we'll see how we go. The US's climate narrative has had many twists and turns in 2020, and I'm sure will be the same in 2021, but hopefully for the better. In a few weeks, when Biden walks into the Oval Office, the truth of the campaign promises will start to emerge, as is the case with every politician on planet. Will the world's biggest economy and the second largest energy consumer accelerate its low carbon trajectory as planned, especially against the backdrop of having just had such relatively recent success with shale oil and shale gas? How will that transition happen? And what can we expect in the next 11 and a half months? Our esteemed speakers, who are detailed there on the screen now and are with us today will get us a little bit closer to that answer. Let's start with each of you please giving me a couple of minutes feedback on the key question. We only have 45 minutes to get through it, so we'll crack on. Please may I start off with Dr. Bazilian, Director of Payne Institute for Public Policy and Professor of Public Policy, Colorado School of Mines. Michelle, thanks very much. It's a, a pleasure and honor to be uh, on the panel today. Um, I'm uh, speaking to you from Colorado in the, in the middle of the United States. Um, that question uh, has been asked and answered in numerous forms over the last, um, uh, since November, uh, early November, as you can imagine. Um, initially, the conversation went something like, um, well, without the, uh, with a hostile Senate or Congress, um, the presidency would be, would have certain limited uh, options for engaging with uh, climate change. Um, there, as a result of that discussion and before the runoffs in Georgia and the Senate, um, the, com the lists of those kind of things emerged, uh, uh, a lot of those lists. And they went something like, well, there are regulatory options, uh, institutional and regulatory options. There are uh, options for things like government procurement. There are options for things like reframing the work of the EPA or the FERC, the regulatory bodies. Um, and there are ways to look at how to embed climate across the government in a department such as energy is sort of obvious, but in others uh, like the treasury, uh, the interior, et cetera. So that was the nature of the conversation until the runoff uh, and the results from the Senate race in Georgia, which then changes the um, balance of power in the Senate. And so the conversation has been reignited in the last just few week, uh, few days or week. Um, and so the, the evolution of the conversation with that um, Senate change becomes that, that uh, there might be a, many more avenues for action on climate change domestically. So um, while it's not um, likely that there will be huge um, bills passed uh, to uh, all encompassing climate change, there, it is much more likely that it can engage in many different um, uh, aspects uh, in, in the, at the federal level in the legislation. And those include most, um, you know, th that might come up most recently, um, soon in the, after the inauguration are about spending. And th that's both uh, spending for stabilization uh, post COVID or during COVID and then stimulus, of course. Um, and then I'll just end by saying, of course, you know, one of the easier things uh, Biden apparently intends to do is, is sign back onto the Paris Agreement. That's a relatively painless thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like an obvious move. The implications or the impacts of signing back onto Paris are not yet uh, clear, but it seems from a diplomatic way that that's what will happen. And by naming someone as senior in the U.S. Mm -hmm. context as uh, Senator Kerry is as uh, the climate envoy internationally. I, I think he's trying to get the signal out uh, that the U.S. is willing to to reengage. So I'll stop there. That's the that's the conversation as 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 I see it from the United States. Excellent. Thank you. We'll delve into several points there momentarily. Uh, welcome to Jeremy Martin, the Vice President of Energy and Sustainability at the Institute of the Americas. Oh, a few comments, if you will. 
No, thank you. I think Morgan <clears throat> hit on some interesting points, the, the political uh, evolution um, and how things change just by the uh, runoff elections in Georgia. It's an excellent point. Um, I think there's a several different pieces or, or points I wanted to put on the table, and then we can come back to in the conversation, um, sort of three points of context and three what I would say are action areas, a, a little bit of dovetailing with what Morgan just got done outlining. Um, and by the way, I agree 100% with Morgan. I think all of the things I'm going to say uh, is, is assumes that the, the U.S. re-enters the Paris Climate Agreement as the Biden administration, incoming Biden administration, has said throughout the campaign and since. So I think that's sort of the, the given here. We don't even need to really talk about that. Um, I think the three points of context are that we are indeed at this transformational moment or juncture um, in, in history right now. It's, it's this, it's this great moment of reckoning, uh, as, as seems to be uh, some people's way of liking to describe it. Um, what I understand is two thirds of the world's uh, greenhouse gases will be in countries committed to net zero emissions. Now the timelines are different, of course, but if you think about it that way, you know. The preponderance of countries in the world have committed to some form or some deadline objective of net zero emissions. But the reality behind that is few of the countries have actually put in place, the, you know, measures or any kinds of, of clear cut delineations of how they all achieve that. So I think we're going to be as part of this transformational juncture entering into a moment of if those net zero goals are to be believed, um, accelerated legislative and regulatory activity. And of course, the context for that translates to the US. I think the other important point of context is just where we are in terms of finance, development banks, uh, international finance, financial institutions have all, or for the most part, are making uh, ESG a guidepost for their investment, right? We've seen this gradually, but I think in the last year or so, this has greatly accelerated. And I argue that that's also something that will be brought along by the Biden administration uh, just by taking office. You know, the driving of capital away from hydrocarbons to more of a clean energy, tran energy transition uh, milieu. The final context I think we want to make sure we understand, and this is going to be something hugely important for the Biden administration, you've already seen it with some of the appointments or nominees, is the uh, idea of a just trans transition, but more importantly, the intersection and connection of climate and in, in, in social justice. Mm -hmm. People uh, like to describe social justice or climate justice, and so I think here in the U.S. that's going to be a huge element in the context of the Biden administration. Um, you know, just just three areas of action I think we'll we'll look to see. And again, this idea of 100 days, it's such a magical, mythical uh, timeline, but it goes fast and, and honestly, not much often gets done. But I think if we could at least see, is my first point, some kind of roadmap um, from the Biden administration and how they're going to manage executive orders. Um, because most of what the Trump administration did in, in, in energy and climate was around executive action, executive orders. Mm -hmm. So... Um, as as those go, therefore, the, the, the incoming administration can can develop, uh, you know, executive orders that reverse those actions to a certain degree. So I think what would be important is to see what the roadmap is, not that they'll be able to execute and implement all those executive actions in the first 100 days. But a roadmap in itself really boosts accountability once you've put that out, that it's uh, your wiggle room is dramatically. Where, yeah, where are you going to focus? I mean, you yeah. know, of the dozens and dozens of actions that you seek to reverse and over, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, push back to sort of a, a pre-Trump era, what are you going to focus on? And as part of that, I think, you know, like Morgan highlighted, it's one thing, you know, day one, they rejoin Paris. Well, what does that mean, um, particularly as we head to Glasgow? What's our what's our NDC? What's sort of the, the revised uh, approach? And, you know, Biden and his team have said net zero by 2050. Okay, like I said in my context, what does that mean and how do we get there, whether it's legislative? I think whether it's Devil right. in the details is something that's really emerging. This is our fourth round table today. We've done Asia, Middle East, Europe, and, uh, and uh, we're, we're very um, happy to be, to be with the US now. And this is the same narrative on a global basis. Is what does this actually mean? These are all very impressive political statements and they take up news headlines and there's lots of handshaking and, and so on. But to obviously get some news headlines going, here we are talking about it. But what does it actually mean? What were the devils and the details? And, and I'd like to go into that more once we've done the introductions. Yeah. Next up is Dr. Robert Brooks, the founder of RBAC. Dr. Brooks, are you able to give us a quick view on, on your thoughts with the critical question? Uh, uh, yes, um, I certainly agree with the other speakers that uh, rejoining the Paris Accord will just happen. I mean, that's been promised and that will happen. So I'm not gonna count that as one of my three points. 
I think probably my points are going to be a little bit different from the two previous speakers. I would say that, um, uh, first of all, I think that uh, it would be very uh, wise for um, uh, new President Biden to see to what extent that he could actually work with the energy companies rather than uh, uh, treating them as essentially enemies, uh, which is a lot what happened under the Obama administration. So um, maybe even something like what uh, Trump did in his early days of office, where he pulled business leaders in and, and actually did some, uh, you might say, surveying of these business leaders, both telling them certain things that they couldn't do anymore, but also, you know, really finding out what, um, you know, how would they approach this? In other words, let's try to make them uh, an element of the team who's trying to achieve these goals. And I think we've seen over the last few years that lots of the energy companies have committed uh, in one way or another to um, um, lower uh, carbon future uh, and even zero carbon future. So I think that that would be a very wise thing to do. Uh, second of all, I think it would be, when you look at it in the global context, I think it would be wise to uh, to support and again not to oppose uh, LNG exports out of the U.S. LNG exports out of the U.S. have uh, the potential for and increasingly one sees uh, the actuality of um, uh, supplanting coal uh, 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 coal powered uh, electricity production around the world. You see this a lot in Southeast Asia, even Vietnam has huge number of projects. Uh, we know about China. India also has uh, these things. And of course, Asia is the big, um, you know, is the big player in emissions and will be in the future. So to the degree that you can reduce uh, with a known commodity, LNG is going to, um, you know, produce uh, less uh, carbon emissions than coal. Yes, I know that there are other issues like methane emissions. I think these things are very important and they can be. These are more like engineering problems. They can yeah. be achieved. They're different. That's different from carbon emissions, which is fundamental chemistry. The At the moment, thing, LNG is, is going to be that useful bridge. Again, we can just, we can debate that uh, shortly. Next up, Mona okay. Dajani, uh, global uh, co-head of one the- One last thing, one last thing, I'm sorry. So I'll just move just on to Mona, and point. then if you come back with your comments when we go into, so we can, we just got an okay. eye on the clock. So we'll move on. Okay. Mona Dajani. Global Co-Head of Energy and Infrastructure Projects at Pillsbury Law. Thank you very much for joining us. Can we have your thoughts, please? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really honored to uh, be a guest on uh, this uh, conference, especially since um, I'm very active in the Middle East as well. Um, I think as the, uh, the sole uh, lawyer on this panel, I have a little bit of a different perspective than my, um, uh, uh, but we're in agreement with, with the rest of my uh, panelists. Um, and uh, first I'd like to amplify what all of them have said. I think that uh, it's, um, I'm thrilled that uh, uh, Biden is um, hopefully, <laughs> if our democracy survives uh, the next few this week, uh, that uh, there, there's going to be tremendous change in in uh, clean energy in the United States. Uh, it will it will entail uh, there's three points that I'd like to make. One is is that we are going to need in the United States a uh, coordinated approach between the government agencies, all the different government agencies, and uh, the different levels of government as well as uh, some also uh, coordination from the business world, which is um, finance, which is what I'm doing a lot of. Um, number two, uh, Trump had, uh, there were about 84 environmental laws that were rolled back by the Trump administration. And I think that, uh, again, as a lawyer, one of the first items that the new uh, Biden administration with the climate action plan needs to do is to address all these um, rollbacks. And uh, we would need to overhaul 
um, these laws, these tax incentives that uh, that he that some of them were uh, expired, as well as uh, funding for certain technologies in the space. Last, uh, I think you know it goes without saying that we need to clean up the power sector in the United States, and that mm -hmm. means that uh, you know there that it needs to be easier for developers and for utilities. And I believe that there were about 62 uh, utilities in the United States that, that signed an initiative to help streamline the process to bring more uh, clean energy projects online. And that means uh, easier access to uh, permitting and to uh, finance and funding. And I, and I wanted to bring up a point that's uh, important. Um, as you know, I am, uh, I sit in uh, Manhattan, but I also in normal times, I spend a lot of time in, in uh, London. I office in London too. And we're doing a lot of sustainable finance. And what that means is we're representing banks that want to encourage borrowers in our space to uh, whether they're oil majors or utilities, or even Fortune 500 companies, to uh, they're they're given credit facilities that we are designing, helping these banks design to encourage more investment in the space, not just in the United States, but uh, where it originated, uh, primarily in, in Europe. So, uh, so I'm very happy to uh, to be part of that too. That's the, the maturity of the financial ecosystem when it comes to the greener side that I think we're beginning to see a lot more. And again, we can we can touch on that. So just moving on, Dr. Bazilian, if you had to, this is a hard question, so uh, I hope you, you'll forgive me. If you had to narrow down top three climate related decisions, I think we can chuck the Paris Agreement out of that. Um, but if you had to narrow that down for President-elect Biden on the 20th of January and shortly thereafter, what would be those top three priorities for you? Yeah, that is a tough question. I know, um, sorry. <laughs> I, I, it, it, I'll try to answer it. The, the, the top three would be um, something like, um, well, for him, I think one of the top three is going to be rejoining Paris, but let's, let's add, add three more to that, uh, which would be, um, getting something meaningful in a stimulus package uh, for climate change. Um, that, that, that seems like a very early uh, thing to, to work on in a big way. So that's spending. I think the second one is going to be what Mona said about um, reversing many of the regulatory decisions of the Trump administration. And there are means for them to do that en masse. So they'll be looking at those um, possibilities that that would be a second one um third one i think is going to be um something like in making sure that the climate issue is embedded throughout the government i think they're using the term all, all of government or something like that where it's not just the focus of the department of energy or the epa but that you see it uh, especially in places like treasury the interior etc um very early on so that that's more about signaling and uh, uh, staffing than it is um, say legislation but those would be three reasonable guesses anyway excellent thank you jeremy do you agree with that would you add one or two or do you think that's that's a fair shot for the first first go for biden yeah you know no i think of course all of that i mean i i think there there's an, an issue around critical minerals which is something morgan and i have, have talked on and off about i think you know again this whole of government approach to critical minerals um and i think one area that there could be and should be some bipartisan uh support is is around this issue of critical minerals particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis china right and so i think we've already seen that uh in, in you know the 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 the, the bill passed in December, some of the energy related elements of that vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, clean energy, um, working backwards to critical minerals and, and sort of how to counter China um, in that space. And that's particularly relevant, you know, in this hemisphere, the Western hemisphere. I think the other thing, and just picking up on a couple of things other folks have said, I, I would, you know, personally, what I'd love to see is indeed the ability for, for U.S. to continue to export our LNG and to continue to seize the LNG opportunity. But to do that, I think it requires significant action. And to me, one of the, the most important action items should be around methane, 
uh, and rolling back immediately um, mm -hmm. and as a priority what the Trump administration did in terms of methane uh, regulation, leakages, oversight, and everything that, frankly, most of the industry didn't really want because the industry was moving farther ahead. Um, you know, there obviously are some smaller players that, that appreciated the moves by the Trump government. But I would suggest that the issue of methane and methane leakages and, and how to manage that is something of critical importance and therefore would allow us to indeed continue to have that opportunity with LNG. I mean, we saw the issue of, of what happened with the potential cargo to France. Um, and so now we need to, as a country, as an industry, demonstrate that the uh, US LNG is as is, is clean as possible. Um, so that's, that's something to me as a priority. And of course, that's a global problem that's been discussed in ports and amongst ship owners worldwide. So arguably, if the US is able to make significant uh, steps forward with that, it could support that positioning as a global leader on the environmental stage. Is that a realistic outlook? Is it realistic that they'll, yeah, no, I think it's 100% realistic that there'll be some action taken on that. To me, it's, it's you know, we, we but, love But enough story. action, sorry to interrupt you, Jeremy, but enough action to, to really put quite a chunk towards the U.S. being repositioned as a climate leader. Yes. Yes, I think it's it's just a matter of of linking up industry and and government and regulation, um, which is already there. It's just a matter of putting it in place. There will be some, of course, outliers in industry, smaller producers, and you know, struggling shale producers. But I, I think the preponderance of companies will absolutely agree and support um, the efforts to, to, particularly on the leakage and in, 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 in the mitigation side. Mona, just a quick question. You mentioned about 84 laws that have been rolled back. Dr. Bazilian touched on it as well just now. Uh, how to give us some sense of context? To me, that seems a lot, and um, especially with a with a discussion that should be moving forward. Am I right in thinking that for the context of our listeners? Yes, it is. I mean, there have been 84 uh regulations that have been rolled back and there's actually more that were on the table and so there were some that were uh cut down so it's actually more than 84 it's about it's over 125 Gosh. you know that all together so um and i think that uh you know some of these the majority of these uh were it, it, interestingly enough um you know, at first were welcomed. And I think just recently there was, um, you know, a, a potential uh, rollback with respect to um, leasing of land for uh, new drilling <laughs> in Alaska, which uh, got very little, just recently, just a few days ago, got very little traction with the oil and gas uh, communities because, uh, they know that it was that why why he did it so late now. So mm -hmm. uh, so yes, and I do believe that one of the first critical pieces that uh, Biden needs to focus on is reversing or at least addressing all these rollbacks and why they were rolled back. And uh, and I also think it's really important. And I no one's really mentioned this, so I want to say it that. Uh, you know, in it's very important to have inclusive prosperity here. And along mm -hmm. with the clean energy plan uh, that Biden is going to implement, that will help a lot of different industries, you know, clean energy, oil and gas, hydrogen, uh, some um, EV. Uh, this is going to create, I believe, uh, and I've worked with a lot of people now that are that are now moving from uh, certain industries into clean energy. So it's creating jobs and uh, with because this will probably be attached uh, to a COVID bill, stimulus bill, it, it will create um, more jobs and promote, I believe, more uh, racial and uh, socioeconomic justice. Uh, well, I think that was touched on just at the beginning, wasn't it? We were talking about the need for social and climate justice to very much be hand in hand. There are no, you know, there are, there cannot be two worlds. 
uh, and economically as well, it needs to be an architecture that that supports that as well. Just a, just a very quick question on those, those numbers, 125 plus, but we'll stick with the 84 just because those were confirmed. Of those, what percentage do you expect Biden to be able to roll back, you know, back out uh, this year? Just a rough percentage. I won't hold you to it. Well, um, I think it's a that's a really tough question because uh, for two reasons. One is your timing of one year. That's mm -hmm. tough. But I do believe, as, as uh, I think uh, Jeremy mentioned, you know, now we're, we're going to have a full Senate. Uh, so it makes it a lot easier for uh, a lot of the uh, changes that Biden wanted to implement in clean energy. So if I was taking, if I was being optimistic, I would say hopefully within a year, at least some of the, 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 uh, the larger, uh, and because of the push right now, uh, I would say at least 25 to 30% uh, in the first year, some of the real obvious ones, mm. you know, just super obvious. But again, like I said, one of the, one of the items that the United States needs to work on is being inclusive right now, we're at an inflection point as a country about what happened in Washington on January 6th. And as a result, we need to become, you know, as a country to uh, work together, all the different agencies and all the different levels of government. And I'm uh, bullish and I'm optimistic that uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'll, my, my, uh, prophecy that I'm uh, telling you now will actually be surpassed. But I'm, I'm, I am uh, cautiously optimistic. Well, it'll be for the good of, good of uh, all, if, the, if that is the yes. case. For Dr. The Brooks, the world. Yes. exactly, exactly, indeed. Dr. Brooks, what are your thoughts on the challenges when it comes to the integration of green gases, and I'll put quote marks before and after those, such as renewable, natural gas, and hydrogen, the latter obviously still very much in the process of being proven on a commercial and a larger scale. What are your thoughts on the challenges of those markets on natural gas and LNG markets in the US? As we've already touched upon the huge potential with further LNG growth, and not even just the substantial market as we stand. This set to overtake Qatar as the world's third, which is, well, is currently third, but set to overtake Qatar as the world's largest LNG exporter. They'd only started exporting en masse in 2016. That's a huge acceleration. So what kind of impact can these other markets have on LNG and, and how to protect it essentially? Uh, well, thank you for that. And actually that leads into the third point that I was gonna make earlier. I got a little bit out of sync with you. I thought you were talking about the first question when I was answering the three points, but uh, my third point did have to do with hydrogen. And I think in the longer term, uh, when we look at a global uh, clean energy world, uh, you have to recognize the fact that in spite of uh, the advances in batteries, there are actual physical limitations on what batteries can do. And they are very, very far from being able to, uh, to have uh, storage capacities over anything more than a few seconds or minutes maybe even a few hours. It's, it's not the same at all as, for example, underground gas storage, which you know lasts for a whole season. So what this means is that um, you have intermittency in, or in uh, wind and solar, which is essentially, you can't just run the whole globe on that, uh, which means you have to have some way of controlling uh, production of electricity and having electricity and having heat when, where you want it, when you want it. So this is the role currently of natural gas. It's also the role of coal, but we know that coal is going out and it should be going out. So that is that is part of it. But in the end, if you wanna look at the longer term, then I think we need to be looking at something that could replace uh, natural gas in the longer term. And hydrogen is clearly something that could be done. Uh, but um, one of the very first things that I think uh, Biden should do is to accelerate the research and development of hydrogen. Uh, this has begun in the United States. It's uh, actually quite a bit more developed already in terms of uh, R&D in Europe. There's actually some pilot programs in Europe and so forth. I think that this is going to be very important. But you asked about challenges. There are huge challenges. 
Uh, hydrogen is not nearly as energy intensive. It's about 30% uh, as energy intensive per cubic meter as uh, natural gas. It takes more effort and more cost to actually move it. There's a lot of challenges. Uh, but I think that uh, these are engineering and scientific challenges that can be overcome and it should be overcome. So I would recommend that uh, a lot of effort go into that in the longer term. But at the same time, recognize that natural gas and LNG have an extremely important role in the meantime. Thank you. We've got a question from our um, chat function on Zoom that I'd like to put to Dr. Bazilian, please. The question is, what are other countries' expectations of the US to be a leader under the Biden administration? What level of optimism, cautious optimism, cynicism, call it what you will, how would, how would you describe that? Well, of, of course, the world is not a homogenous place, and so there's quite a few different views of what the role the United States should play. I, I we'll, think we'll take the, the world's largest economies. We'll go that way. Um, yeah okay um <laughs> e e even there there's there's a diversion of opinions but l let's say that um I, I think there's there's cautious optimism that you know they're going to see the biden administration take uh climate change on the international stage seriously at least mm -hmm. uh, i think most of them rightly are fairly cynical about how the united states has has been acting as a partner on climate change uh, over a, a long time and, and obviously sees its ups and downs as a partner and not necessarily as a really reliable one. So I'm hoping that the Biden administration approaches the international community with significant humility and focuses on a domestic program that uh, shows its, its, its uh, own leadership at home before it proposes to be any kind of leader abroad. Because that is part of the plan, isn't it, with the Biden's messaging is that he's going to call on other countries to intensify their targets and position himself as and, and I think as you just touched on, a lot of people think when, when he says that, hang on, get get your own order, your own home in order first. Um, That's exactly correct. Yeah. So that that is the um in my view, the worst part of the 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 Biden climate approach. The rest of it is is very uh, impressive and 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 thoughtful. The the approach about naming and shaming uh, external countries mm -hmm. on climate change is rather absurd. Jeremy, we have another question. The question is: Might there be an appetite to revive Obama's clean power plant plan? Sorry, to get states to clean up their utilities. Mine has already discussed how many utilities, I think it was 62 utilities, have gone together to try and help streamline, including improving access to permits and, and finance as well. Does this fit into that picture? And do you see there being appetite to revive Obama's push? Uh, I, there should be, I guess, if you take it at face value, the net zero commitment. Um, and, mm -hmm. You know, what's, what, what are the elements that are going to populate the net zero commitment? So, yes, the, the sort of updated version of the, the clean power plan could be something. Um, you know, some people might argue that it's not enough right now. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that, that that was a, at that point in time an important effort, but um, it needs to be. So, you know, updating that idea or that general framework to, to what we need today. Again, and I keep coming back if we if we look at sort of what the goal and the metrics are um, down the road, how do we get there? And that's where you need to start, like you said, you know, filling in the blanks or the devils in the details. I think the good news is just to emphasize something, whether it be, you know, on clean power, which, you know, that was an effort at the congressional level. But I think what's important in their score here is that so much of what the Trump administration did, and I think I, I said this, but it bears repeating, was through executive action. OK, mm -hmm. and so, so much of what the Trump administration did in the energy and climate space were executive orders. And so those can very easily or not very easily, but can relatively easily be reversed again by a new executive order, by the executive branch issuing a new order. So mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily need to go through what will still be a fairly divided Congress. Um, you know, there, there will be a lot of other focal points at the Congress on recovery, on stimulus and all the economic elements, uh, not to mention the health and, 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 and pandemic crisis. So I, I suggest again that I think what will happen and should happen is just a, a, a roadmap for executive action, um, reversing most of those Trump uh, era um, or Trump administration EOs. 
Excellent, thank you. I think let's bring up a quick survey question. Uh, Emma, please make it the second survey question. I believe we've answered the first, so there's no need for us to vote on that one. There we go, right. Biden's climate and environmental justice proposal to make a federal investment of 1.7 trillion US dollars over the next 10 years will happen in its totality, every single cent, despite the rising economic damage being wreaked by COVID-19. Just a quick yes or no. If you don't have a view either way, by all means, please don't vote. And then you can just tell me afterwards and, and give us more of an idea. But it'd just be interesting to see where your confidence lies in that the plans that have are being made. Of course, this is still all on paper. The, the proof isn't yet. Uh, well, the proof isn't in the pudding. We haven't, haven't tasted the pudding just quite yet. Just get an idea of where you stand with it. And as soon as Emma can, we'll get the get the answers through. While we're waiting, Mona, what do you think will be the majority, yes or no? Um, I think yes. Okay, Dr. Brooks? Uh, I think, uh, I don't know what the uh, majority of our listeners are going to say. You know, certainly I would say it, it would be extremely challenging, especially because not just the uh, recovery from uh, COVID, we don't know really uh, how much the new administration is going to be um, uh, trying to solve this problem by um, uh, keeping the economy from uh, being fully open. So we don't know. Uh, so the economy being open, uh, if it's not, then that means more stimulus, more money is going to go into that. So you got to ask the question, well, what room is there for a Green New Deal or any of those other kinds of initiatives in the near term? Uh, the economy, I think, is the key in all of this. Emma, can you put us out of our misery? What was the answer? Ah, oh, there we go. Interesting. 60% do not think every cent will be available. Human so beings are that, cynical. Yeah. <laughs> so as you said... Some cynical uh, animals, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As Dr. Brooks said, it, it comes down to the economy and uh, numbers don't lie. So that's uh, so, Jeremy, you feel that's too cynical? Um, no, I think it, it's, it's somewhere between cynicism and realism, um, hmm. not optimism. I think I would use maybe two other uh, terms here, which is uh, idealism uh, or versus pragmatism. And I think mm. in the end, uh, pragmatism is going to win. Uh, you know, I had a story when I was in China where they were talking about uh, Mao and his programs and so forth, you know, which were all oriented towards a certain kind of idealism. But, you know, he always kept his pragmatists uh, kind of uh, uh, available, you know, when the economy got too bad, you know, to, to actually come and pull it out of the fire. And uh, so I think that there's going to have to be this combination. And if it goes too far towards um, uh, unworkable idealism, uh, hopefully, you know, Biden has enough uh, uh, sense from his long experience in government that he can uh, kind of pull back uh, towards something that's actually going to be workable. Mm. Dr. Bazilian, one of the questions that's popped up is building one of the questions is how to build trust with um, data with international partners. But if I may just make that a broader question, the America first policy or stance rather from, from the White House that has been held more predominantly in recent years is, is giving way to more openness and partnerships and with the negative angle as we just touched on in terms of naming and shaming as well. But on a positive note, more partnerships going forward. And as I say, one of the, one of the, um, one of the, participants is just touching on the need for trust and um, between the US and international partners, which has probably been damaged in recent years for various reasons. You can see the chat if you wish to elaborate. Do you think that that is going to be a huge driver in the climate policy this year? Or do you think it will be an accompanying driver? How, how much appetite is there in the US to, to tally up globally? Yeah, I, I'm not completely uh, sure I understand the question, but let's take it that um, the, the I'll, first I'll sentence of it. Because you, if you don't understand it, I didn't ask it properly. The question is, ignoring the chat for a moment, because that touches on the virus in China. So the question is, 
how much appetite does the US have for global partnerships this year? And will that be a major driver in getting this climate narrative changed or will it be an accompanying driver? How powerful will it be? I, I think partnerships are going to be very important to, to the US uh, international approach to climate change, if that's the question. I think they'll, they'll be, they should be fundamental and uh, um, foundational for the US approach internationally. I think, you know, Joe Biden has a history of being um, not just a deal maker, but a, uh, a, a good collaborator uh, and the way he's formed the personnel at the State Department so far speaks to that as well. So I, I think you're going to see a, 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 a lot of partnerships. Um, just for two seconds on the data question, um, not specifically the question that was posed, but it is the case these days, uh, and we work on this quite a lot, that um, data is becoming um, more available from public sources uh, like satellites. And so we work on a lot of satellite data as an example. and. Um, that uh, helps uh, us and global partners um, feel that there is more trusted data available and that amount of data and that technology is only increasing. And so I think mm -hmm. we'll see more and more of that to underpin these partnerships. Excellent. Another point that's popped up on the chat, this is actually, I have to say on a, on a very positive note, there's never been so many questions uh, in all the panels today versus uh, today's, there's quite a few, um, quite a lot of engagement from our listeners, which is fantastic. This question is very much on the cultural side. This is hard, harder to quantify than a, a numbers game, but from a cultural side, how, obviously the US is a huge country, it's very diverse. Some of the difficulties Mona's already touched upon, how to spur the cultural shift so that there's as best as possible uniformity across the nation when it comes to the importance of climate. Dr. Brooks, are you happy to take this one? Yeah, it is a very difficult question. I think mm -hmm. that uh, uh, there's a lot of skepticism uh, about uh, data that has been, or uh, narratives that have come out over the uh, you know, past uh, four or five, six years, whatever. And it's going to be uh, with the censorship that's uh, currently going on from big tech and so forth. Uh, it's, I think a lot of people are having a difficult time trusting uh, that uh, uh, the kind of information that they previously had access to is going to be available in the future. Uh, I know this myself, even, uh, you know, when I uh, say, I'm thinking, you know, I'd like to do some kind of a, a search, you know, on the internet, you know, using Google or whatever. And, and actually, I'm already discouraged and I even stop right now because I know how much censorship is going on. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I really don't know to what extent that you can get um, a consensus going again when it's uh, currently so fractured in the United States. Uh, just to be I honest can, with I you. can make a comment to that, uh, yeah, Michelle. Please go ahead, Mike. Censorship, yeah, by the I way. Think we kind of, <laughs> I think that, um, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, I'm sitting in Manhattan. I'm intersecting with Wall Street every day, usually <laughs> in a non-COVID way. And um, in the United States, there's a growing number of investors and companies that are, that are refusing to invest in um, conventional energy sources as the economics become less attractive. And, and instead they're focused a lot more on um, clean energy and clean technologies. Um, this has been um, a, you know, a watershed year for the United States and globally too as well, in terms of corporations making climate announcements, climate commitments and they have pledged, you know, to to offset all their uh, carbon. Um, you know, just like in the transportation sector, we have airlines uh, mm -hmm. that are uh, U.S. based and also around the world that are pledging for carbon neutrality. And most notably, and which I'm really proud about, is that we're seeing a lot of oil and gas majors such as BP and Shell. Uh, Equinor uh, and, and uh, uh, Chevron, other companies 
uh, that are really pushing this to, uh, to unite not only the United States, but the world uh, culturally in terms of uh, promoting uh, you know, uh, a net zero future. Excellent, thank you very much. Dr. Bazilian, are you still there? I am, yes. yes. Uh, as, as a supporter of this session, please, can you just give, I know you said you're going to shoot off, so we've just timed it, so you've probably got 30 seconds, uh, just to give some closing comments, please. Uh, well, just th thanks to Gulf Intelligence and to you, Michelle, for 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 the panel. I think it's a a, um, a very obviously topical issues you've been covering. Um, I I think that the Biden administration has been fairly, uh, at least relatively extremely transparent, actually, in what they intend to do and how they intend to uh, approach climate change. Um, they have a lot of people who have experience in government that they've nominated for new roles. Um, many of them, uh, it looks like the vast majority of them came from the Obama administration. And so I don't think you'll have to guess too much uh, how they'll approach the climate issues, both domestically and internationally, as they both told us and the people's experience led you to understand what they would uh, uh, consider to be the right thing. So now it's really a case of trust, something that's come up during the session in five or six different ways, trust, 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 and, and, and we'll see. We'll see what rolls out. That is a wrap. Thank you very, very much to each of you. Jeremy, I'm sorry we couldn't come back to you. We've run out of time. I, I had a few No, thanks for the opportunity. Pleasure.